All right. Well, thank you all for coming to our first uh, online Zoom graduate alumni symposium at SF State. We're really excited to have everybody. I know we were all hoping to be here live in person at San Francisco. This is a aerial view of campus and today is a beautiful day. It looks just like this pretty much. Uh, ACSM was scheduled to be this week. Um, and again, we can't make it, but I'm glad that we're all here at least online to hang out and say hi to everybody. And so uh, again, I hope everybody's having a safe, healthy and happy week. I want to thank Chloe, Liam and Casey from Exercises Medicine to, that helped it host this event for us. Uh, here's kind of the agenda today. We're just going to do some kin grad updates. Uh, we'll uh, honor Dr. Kern's retirement, big deal, and then uh, go through what you're all here for, the alumni guest lectures. And then finally, we'll end with a Q&A that will be led by the Exercises Medicine crew. So now I'd like to have uh, Dr. Vera come and have a few updates on our grad program. Thanks, Dr. Bagley, and uh, thank you for putting this together. I think this is a terrific event, and hopefully it'll be the, the first of many to come, and they'll just keep expanding, and then hopefully we get to be in person again, too, soon. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see you all, um, even if virtually, and, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy uh, throughout all of this. And I know we have, I think so far, predominantly alumni of the program on, but this is going to live forever on YouTube. So I just want to um, extend an invitation to those of you who are interested in graduate work in kinesiology and especially exercise physiology uh, to apply to our program. You have the information on this slide so you can get to our website. Um, and for fall 2020, we've extended our deadline. So you have until July 1st, um, if you would like to go ahead and apply and, and no GRE uh, for this fall. We have uh, temporarily suspended the GRE requirement um, and we're extending that from fall 2020 admission through to fall 2021. Um, you can go to gradsfsu.edu for your online application information. And if you have any questions at all about the program, uh, don't hesitate to contact me via email. Be happy to uh, uh, communicate with you. Great, thanks Dr. Virai. And also the biggest update here, Dr. Mary Alice Kern is retiring after 25.5 years. So congratulations, Dr. Kern. And that 0.5 is important. I know, especially for uh, retirement, pay and all that type stuff. But um, we, we were really happy to have Dr. Kern. I was super lucky to have overlapped with her at SF State for the last five or six years. Um, really enjoyed my time working with her and hope that we can continue working uh, in some aspect. But yeah, Dr. Kern's been here for over 25 years, had over 100 graduate students as either the chair or a committee member on thesis, you know, taught dozens and dozens of sections of classes and has been irreplaceable in, in my opinion and a great, great um, uh, mentor to me over the last few years. So if you'd like to take a few minutes, Dr. Kern, uh, and speak, go ahead. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Um, it's just wonderful. I was trying to figure out of the students who are having presented how many of you I was a member of your committee. And I think probably six out of the eight of you, I was a part of your committee. Um, Taylor, Dulce, Kelly, Brittany, um, who else we got in there? Casey. So it was, uh, it's nice to hear what you're doing and to see what you're doing out there in the world. And that's the best part of the whole program is watching where all the students go. So <laughs> that's it. Thanks, Mary Alice. talk is GPS recalculating from Santa Barbara to Auburn and everything in between. A quick overview of who I am. I am a first generation Mexican American. I'm also the first in my family to have had the opportunity to graduate from college. And I am currently a third year doctoral student and a teaching research assistant. Uh, I was born and raised in Santa Barbara, California. And originally I thought I wanted to go to medical school mainly because of the communication barriers that immigrant families face in the healthcare system. And this led me to want to go to UC Davis to major in exercise biology to hopefully become a more well-rounded and competitive student for med school. 
But at UC Davis, I started questioning whether med school was the right route for me um, for two reasons. So I was having a lot of difficulties with um, the 10 week quarter system, uh, emotionally and physically, but it was mainly because of the internships I had at the medical center that helped me realize the financial that and sacrifices that these physicians had made with family and friends in order to get to this point in their career. And I didn't think that this was the only route for me to stay in the medical system. So I started talking with a couple of professors to figure out what I could do where I could still be applying what I had learned. And kind of that led me to decide that I wanted to become an exercise physiologist and it would allow me to do everything that I was learning at the moment. So we thought that for me to be a competitive candidate for the job market, I needed to get a master's degree. And this is what led me to San Francisco State in 2015. And I had an amazing cohort that I entered with that eventually became my family. Uh, and thanks to this ambitious group of individuals around me, it helped me self-reflect to become a better student, better researcher, and even a better presenter. And because of them, I became so involved in the department. So within that first year, I became the teaching research assistant. I also became the lab coordinator for the exercise physiology lab. At one point, I had 15 undergraduate students under my wing, uh, making sure that we had everything prepared for instructors when they were teaching and that we could do all the testing for the general community. So I'm hitting the two year mark and I need to figure out what my thesis would be. I never thought that my thesis would be looking at virtual reality games, but it was. So what we did is we took 40 participants. Uh, we had them play three different virtual reality games and measured oxygen consumption to determine the exercise intensity they achieved for these games and see if this could be used as an alternative exercise modality. Uh, and thanks to all of these experiences, I was able to attend but also present at multiple regional and national conferences and expand my network and kind of figure out what other job opportunities I could have outside of uh, academia. So I graduated within two years and I knew I was passionate about academia and research, but I wasn't sure if I really needed that doctoral degree for me to kind of be happy with my job choices. So I decided to take a year off. I was burnt out, but I also wanted to see kind of what jobs I could get during that one year with that current degree and figure out where I was at that time point. So these were all the jobs I was able to kind of take on. And while I enjoyed while I, what I was doing, it wasn't necessarily something I saw myself doing long term. So that doctoral program was in the back of my head for a while. And at this point, I knew I wanted to pursue that. So I knew I was interested in cardiovascular health. And I knew that I had wonderful resources in kinesiology. So I talked with all of our professors. I, I hassle every professor in that department. I'm pretty sure every professor knows the question I ask them. But I wanted to make sure that I was asking the right questions to this potential mentor, to that lab, and to the department to make sure that I was making the right choice because this was going to be a huge commitment that I was going to be taking on. So that led me to two potential mentors at two different universities. And eventually, the professor at UIC offered me a full assistantship, and he would love to take me on in his lab, but he was actually relocated. He was moving to Auburn University, uh, and he would love to have me go on. Well, first thing, I needed to figure out where Auburn University is. Uh, found out it was in Alabama. It took me a while to kind of get adjusted to that idea, but I went to visit both campuses. And before leaving Auburn University, trying to head back to the airport, I knew that I was going to accept this position just because of the social support the doctoral students had within this program and the fact that their voices were constantly being heard by the faculty in order for them to succeed. So I packed all my stuff up. I moved to Auburn University to work under Dr. Michael Brown uh, in the Hypertension and Vascular Health Lab in the School of Kinesiology. So just a quick overview, uh, African Americans have the highest prevalence and progression of cardiovascular disease than any other race or ethnicity. And what our lab is focused on doing is better understanding the mechanisms and pathways that can potentially be playing a role in these racial differences in the endothelium. So the endothelium is that single cell layer that is interacting with the blood and the smooth muscle to regulate vascular tone. And what we do is we grow human umbilical vein endothelial cells, uh, and then we uh, expose them to high laminar shear stress, 
which allows us to kind of mimic chronic aerobic exercise adaptations you see in your vessels in the human body. And by doing this, we can then better understand the cellular and molecular events that are occurring uh, with exercise adaptations in the endothelium. So we, are then are, we then can probe for protein and RNA of interest to determine if exercise is able to reduce the racial differences in endothelial function and hopefully overall cardiovascular health. So a way we kind of confirm that shear stress worked in our cell model is looking at the morphological changes. So pre-shear is just a cobblestone shape. And after they've been exposed to shear stress, you start seeing this elongation of the cells uh, in the direction of the stress that was placed on them. So this is what we do. If you ask me at this point what I want to do with my life, I don't really know, but I know that I am interested in teaching. So I love that I've been doing that this past two years. But I also love the research that we're doing. And I think the next step for me at this point is going to a postdoc to find out kind of what would be the best path for me, but to also expand my skills uh, in the research techniques that I need to kind of continue asking the questions that I want to ask. Uh, and since coming to Auburn, I've really hit the ground running. So within my first year at Auburn University, even before starting the program, I came that summer, I was able to kind of start networking with the professors in the department, but also within the university. And I started working on my lab skills uh, at that time point and shadowing the senior doctoral students in my lab. I was able to present at the Southeast ACSM and win first place for the uh, master's poster competition. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to take on the Leadership and Diversity Training Program Award. So this paired me with a mentor within this regional chapter who helps guide me and kind of give me her personal experiences as she went through this path herself. Uh, and also I was able to take on that same award at the national level. So they paired me with another mentor, which is Dr. Fieto, an amazing individual at um, Kennesaw State University that allows, allows me to have more uh, resources outside of Auburn University that are willing to support me through this whole kind of journey. So that has been a wonderful experience so far. Kind of the second year, I've been able to take on two different fellowships. Um, everyone that's currently in a doctoral program knows that the stipend is not that great. Um, and any little extra amount of money that you can get at that time point really helps you so that you don't have to have that extra stress or burden about that and just focus on your research and teaching skills. Uh, and then finally, because I love the Southeast Regional Chapter so much, I threw myself in the election uh, and was able to take on student representative for the next two years. We'll see how that goes uh, and kind of learn more the backside of how a conference is organized. Uh, and I've also had the opportunity to present at the Rapid Research Race, which is a two minute presentation of kind of what your lab is currently doing. And I won first place on that, which was a wonderful experience. Uh, so these are kind of the things that I've been doing with my life up till now. So anyways, uh, my name is Donnie. I am a former graduate student and I'm about to give you all a bunch of bad advice. So uh, keep in mind the name of my presentation as we're moving forward. I'm going to try to go through as much as I can. I'm going to leave a lot of stuff out due to the time constraints. So please feel free to email me, uh, Donnie at appearon.life. It's right there on the title screen. So uh, please reach out if you have any questions later on. So uh, before we get started, I'd, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Dr. Kern. Uh, there's a lot of other people I'd like to thank too, but this day is not about you. Uh, so relax, it's about Dr. Kern. Um, and also, I guess, congratulations to Dr. Bagley on his recent acceptance of uh, tenure. So who am I? Just a little bit of background. I uh, went to high school in San Jose at Westmont. I was never a great student. Uh, you could probably say I'm still not. And uh, did just enough uh, to graduate and play sports. Was never really interested much in school. I worked uh, nights and weekends and summers as a plumber and I realized I hated it so much. So I guess if I went to school, I could find myself in a cozier desk job than working in the trenches every day. Uh, so I went to De Anza Community College, got my four year degree there, and eventually transferred to San Francisco State University, uh, where I got my Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology. Uh, again, I wasn't really a good student there. I think my senior year, I didn't even know what time my classes started. I would show up an hour or two late as people were leaving. 
uh, I was just kind of going through the motions and having a good time uh, while I was there. <clears throat> so uh, I also didn't have a lot of advice coming from my family. I was the first person in my family to uh, graduate as well. Uh, so I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of told that you have to uh, go to school and doesn't matter, things will just sort of work themselves out. So the best advice, or the first piece of advice I could give is just keep going to school and working hard. Life will sort of figure itself out. I never really had a plan, and I'm assuming a lot of other people do not as well. But keep in mind uh, the name of this presentation. So I wanted to just keep going to school. I just used my bachelor degree to become a bartender, and I was making good money, but life felt meaningless. So I uh, fast forward eventually. I uh, got into the kinesiology program uh, for my master's in exercise physiology here at San Francisco State University. I uh, didn't really know what I was doing, just, it just felt right and felt like something I would uh, enjoy at least learning about and continuing my education. Uh, so the first year, uh, it was actually pretty intimidating. It felt like everyone else in my cohort was uh, smarter than me, uh, better looking than me, and just seemed to have life figured out when I was sitting there not knowing what I was doing. Uh, as the first semester went on, I realized I was still very bad at taking exams, and my public speaking was a disaster as well. I had all my papers ripped apart, and it definitely put me back into place and made me uh, sort of focus in and try to, uh, I guess, improve myself as a, a student. So eventually I made friends, uh, which alleviated a lot of the stress. As you can see here, we're just having a good old time. Uh, some of these people I'm still friends with today, uh, no matter where they moved from, and it wouldn't be... That would have been a lot more miserable of an experience if I hadn't met all of you, so thank you. Uh, I had done a lot of research, or I guess all of my research projects were more focused on the clinical aspects of things. Uh, and eventually, Dr. Bagley reached out to me at the end of the fall semester asking if I could help him with the fall, a small project with Edison Pharmaceutical, which was doing some uh, blood work with uh, studying, it was a study on a metabolic syndrome. So from there, I was able to, uh, sort of, I guess, further myself uh, with research and me meeting new people. The next piece of advice I could give is take on every opportunity uh, you can. Uh, the reason why, uh, I hear this advice a lot from other people, just try to get your hands as many projects as you can. Uh, but unfortunately for me, it had a little bit of a negative impact. I was doing too much. I was a full-time grad student. I was working nights and weekends, uh, still doing bartending. I was shadowing and eventually teaching two classes. I wanted to get my hands at every single research project possible. Unfortunately, I ended up bailing on a lot of commitments I had made. Uh, it did make me feel an awful lot of shame and as if I was uh, letting some people down. So uh, for those of you who are getting into the grad program, it's good to uh, take on multiple opportunities, but you have to realize that uh, it is a lot of work and make sure you're sparsing your time out correctly. I lost a lot of focus in my courses, especially the ones I wasn't as interested in. Uh, my health kind of took a toll on my health as well, and I lost a few relationships and, you know, lessened those with my family and my friends as well. <laughs> so one thing that did stick, a uh, project that I did stick with, uh, was what eventually became my thesis. I got together with Dr. Bagley and some folks down at the VA, uh, some of the better minds in kinesiology and uh, exercise medicine throughout the state of California, and for some reason me, as you can see right here. Uh, this became my thesis project, and it was on end-stage renal disease patients. There's a lot going on here, uh, but just to sum it up real quick, it's a 12-week concurrent training program with uh, folks who are on uh, hemodialysis treatment. I uh, did single muscle fiber mice and heavy chain analysis pre-post uh, training programs. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot of research still coming out. Uh, we're still getting some stuff published, but it was a good experience where I met a lot of people, and it was always a topic of conversation during any uh, interviews I had afterwards. So year two, uh, so the first year was pretty stressful, didn't know what I was doing, didn't think I was gonna graduate on time, but things sort of started falling in line. So back to just working hard, uh, things eventually fell into place. Uh, course load became more manageable. Uh, I got more used to uh, the structure of graduate school, which worked a lot uh, better for the type of learner I was. I proposed my thesis in fall, defended it in spring, and rode off into the sunset. As you can see, all these pictures of here, just having a good time. Uh, so I graduated and didn't really think about what I was doing still at that point. Just thought if I was going to school, things would work themselves out. Soon realized I had no postgraduate uh, graduate school plans. 
I considered uh, going back into school, getting into med school, and I actually started retaking some courses to make up for some bad grades. Uh, but at the end of that summer semester following my graduation, I uh, heard that Dulce was leaving to Auburn, and I uh, conveniently slid into her old job position, uh, which was as a clinical research exercise physiologist at UCSF. Uh, so what you can see, uh, what I did there, uh, I spent about a year and a half there doing body composition testing, a lot of physical assessments, but mostly data management, coordinating with uh, medical directors and private investigators and things along those lines. I threw this a description of our uh, lab up here on the right. So for any current ex students, you can see that the stuff that we teach you is actually useful in uh, your potential career. You could go through this list on the right and probably highlight uh, which labs they correlate to in ex -phys. Uh, my old coworker and I would always laugh that it was stuff that we thought we would never use, and we ended up using it every day uh, for our job. So uh, make sure you're paying attention, that's all I'm saying. Uh, pros, I really enjoyed the testing of stuff I was familiar with. Uh, I did a lot of networking with doctors and salesmen, a lot of downtime, so I was able to uh, practice my lectures for later in the night while I was still teaching and grade a lot of homework, and I probably saw my manager only once a month, which was awesome. The pay was okay, it felt uh, unfulfilling it sometimes, and the less I worked, I still got paid the same. There was no incentive to work harder. And subjects never wanted to be there. They were offering getting paid just to do clinical uh, trials. And my coworker was on the keto diet, which uh, grew pretty annoying the longer I was stuck in a lab with her. <clears throat> so I met some connections, uh, some salesmen, and I started doing, I uh, had a lot of downtime, so I was doing renegade body composition testing for people. Uh, and I eventually met these folks down here at Apiron. Uh, they were a startup company and they were growing, so they put out applications for people to uh, fill in as an exercise physiologist. Uh, they didn't interview anyone that they liked, so they came to me one day and asked how much uh, they would have to pay me for me to leave my current job with UCSF and come work with them. Uh, and the best part was that they let me pick my own job title. So I said I wanted everyone to call me King Dragon, uh, but they didn't really like that. And so I went with senior exercise physiologist because it sounded pretty nifty. So our founder was part of the or is part of the Olympic Committee, and he was wondering why we uh, have all these uh, high profile or a lot of this very uh, high level testing and prescription done to these elite athletes. Why couldn't he have that for himself and all of his executive friends? So he built a high performance testing facility uh, for high performing executives, people who sacrifice their health for wealth. Uh, I have a bunch of NDAs signed, so I'm not going to get into who our clients are, but they are CEOs of these companies down here. Uh, what we do is we do advanced scientific testing, and uh, we focus primarily on efficient aging, do a full comprehensive health analysis, set goals and design programs, train and monitor. Uh, you can check out our website if you want more detail on what we actually do there. So what do I specifically do? I do in-depth physical testing, aggregate and present data, I develop exercise programs, play with new equipment, a whole bunch of other stuff. It is a startup, so my arms get pulled in new directions every week. Uh, every week is a surprise. I might be, uh, feels like I'm in, uh, back in x -Phys lab one week, and the next week I feel like an app developer, uh, which is really good because it keeps my attention uh, drawn to uh, what I'm doing. Uh, the pros, a uh, very good money. Uh, I've already paid off my student loans, which is excellent. Uh, more money than I thought I'd be making right out of college. Uh, private company, so there's no rules. I uh, get to network with a lot of the elite of the area. I get to be part of the group, so the, uh, the amount of work that I put in directly reflects uh, the uh, success of the company. We get to work with a very small number of clients and use all the fun equipment. If there's something I want to use, I can just ask, and typically they will buy it for us, and we have it there. Uh, cons, I get to sit in meetings all day, which can grow boring listening to people talk. I'm going to work all days, nights, and weekends. I never have any time off. And dealing with the complexities and uncertainties of a startup, especially with the job security. Uh, so, anyways, uh, do not study kinesiology. The reason why is our brains will eventually be transferred to a computer, rendering our bodies useless. Uh, but in the unlikely event that this does not happen, I guess it is very important. Uh, specifically, should you get your master's or PhD? Uh, it really depends. You have to be passionate about it. This is not going to be your golden ticket, so make sure you don't uh, put. Uh, yourself into a lot of debt for this. So make sure it's something that you actually enjoy doing and enjoy the journey itself. Uh, there's a lot of success, but there's also a lot of people who do have some regrets. So just think uh, methodically before you enter any sort of uh, graduate program. Uh, and shout out to uh, my team here, uh, as far as our founders, our current staff, and our advisory board as well. Thank you.
Um, hi, everybody. It's really, really good to see everybody again, um, to be able to talk with my friends and see what you guys are doing now out in the world beyond San Francisco State. Um, today, I want to just talk to you about my journey from being a personal trainer to now being a clinical exercise scientist. So I would say my journey began when I graduated with my bachelor's degree in kinesiology from Cal State Fullerton. Um, at the time, my goal was to be a strength and conditioning specialist. I wanted to be a personal trainer, a coach, work in the applied field of kinesiology. I had no interest in doing research. I had no interest in doing physical therapy, which I know is really popular in kinesiology undergrad programs. I didn't want any of that. All I wanted to do was to train people to promote health and fitness because I knew inherently that exercise is medicine, as most people listening can agree with. Um, so during my time at Cal State Fullerton, I took a lot of applied courses for training, things like strength and conditioning, um, program design, group exercise instructing, things like that. Uh, I had no little to no research experience other than just volunteering in master's students research projects. Um, and my advisor, Dr. Galpin, was really uh, adamant on having us get exposed to research just because even if we were clinicians, his argument was always that, you know, we need to keep learning as clinicians and, and staying up to date in the literature. And me getting immersed in that field kind of created a little spark inside of me that I left dormant for a couple years. I still knew I didn't want to do grad school and I wanted to go be a personal trainer, but it made research really exciting to know that I could do um, research that wasn't just like microscopy or like what I thought was working with petri dishes and things like that. But instead, I could do research in figuring out like what a good deadlift is or, you know, whether you should do a banded deadlift or a, um, a unbanded deadlift, certain things like that. So. Um, even still, I decided no grad school for me, and I decided to be a personal trainer and a coach. And I spent two years uh, working as a balance and mobility instructor at senior centers across Southern California, and also a personal trainer at a Globo gym. And I loved my job. It was really amazing, everything that I was doing, and the fact that I could get to work with people every day and help them change their body composition and get stronger. But I was running into this continual problem uh, not necessarily a problem, but this a concern that a lot of my clients had. I think that this is something that a lot of personal trainers and fitness professionals get in the industry because we are quote unquote health professionals. We're not doctors, but we're health professionals and we see our clients more regularly than they see their doctors. Oftentimes they have questions for us that are out of our scope. And that's exactly what started to happen to me. Yes, a lot of my clients were asking me questions like, how do I lose weight or how do I get stronger? But they were also asking me questions about comorbid conditions that were really clinical that I had no idea how to explain to them. Things like, how do I get off my diabetes medication? Or how do I get off my hypertensive medication? Things like that. And it started to make me realize that I, I probably needed to answer some of these questions, not to diagnose anyone, not to become a doctor, but just to understand it better so that I could address these clients a little bit more um, uh, effectively. So I went back to graduate school, and my overall goal at the time was to prove that skeletal muscle saved, saved lives, which I know is very audacious, and it's very far-reaching, and I don't think I've answered that question yet. I think I've gotten closer, but I did this because during my time in between undergrad and grad school, I got really interested in resistance exercise, Olympic weightlifting, um, powerlifting, and I knew inherently that skeletal muscle was really therapeutic that if we could help increase skeletal muscle in clinical populations, it could have some pretty positive effects. So I decided to move up to San Francisco um, from Southern California and start a graduate program um, <clears throat> at San Francisco State. My overall goal while I was here was broadly to use exercise physiology to elucidate the influence of skeletal muscle on health. Um, and I did this in a lot of different ways, obviously through research and things like that, but um, I was able to collaborate with other students in the muscle physiology lab. I think that this was probably like our first meeting ever in 2015. Um, so throwback. Uh, I was also my own lab rat. So I got to look at muscle physiology, but I take tissue from my own body and, and just play around with it and see what was going on at a physiologic or microscopic level. Um, I also was a part of helping to start the strength and conditioning club on campus because it was really important to me to not only get deep into the physiology of skeletal muscle and exercise physiology as a whole, but also keep bringing it back to the people, keep applying it to, 
society. And I wanted to promote strength and conditioning to undergrads and grads on campus so that they could go and disseminate that research to uh, the people that they were going to be working with. And then any graduate student that works in muscle physiology knows that I probably did the same thing. I spent hours and hours pulling muscle fibers. My overall research question at the time was to see if exercise could mitigate microgravity induced skeletal muscle atrophy. So essentially microgravity is just what happens when you go to space, it's zero gravity. And it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to work for NASA or that I even wanted to work in space flight in general, but when I was at San Francisco State, an opportunity presented itself. We had some data and we had some people at UC Irvine and Cal State Long Beach who wanted to collaborate and look more in-depthly at skeletal muscle physiology under microgravity. Um, and then they also wanted to, um, I thought that this would be a really good opportunity for me because microgravity in my mind at the time was a perfect physiologic model to explain muscle atrophy. And I wanted to look at muscle atrophy in clinical populations. So I thought that by doing this project, it would allow me to just kind of better understand what was happening at the uh, molecular level. And then also too, to see how exercise could mitigate this pathway and hopefully preserve muscle. And overall we found you know, like most researchers that we don't really know the answer. It's like the more you know, the more you know you don't know. But we found that it is potentially possible that exercise could preserve microgravity induced skeletal muscle atrophy. So that was cool. Overall, during my time at San Francisco State, I learned pathologic mechanisms of muscle physiology. I felt much more confident about exercise physiology as a whole and how to explain that to people in clinical populations. Um, I also looked, I also understood more the impact of muscle loss in healthy populations. But again, kind of going back to the beginning, my original intent to go to grad school was to see how exercise physiology and muscle physiology could be translated to clinical populations. So I moved back down to LA and I decided to continue going to school. Um, and I started working in uh, exercise oncology in the Integrative Oncology Center uh, with my PI, Dr. Christina Daly Connery at USC. And our goal overall was to look at how exercise could mitigate comorbidities in uh, cancer survivors, particularly breast and prostate cancer survivors. So oftentimes cancer survivors um, have these kind of underlying conditions that stem from them going through chemotherapy and hormone treatments and all of those things, immunotherapy that all cause all of these unintended side effects. So our job or our goal was to see if exercise could help restore some of those physiologic processes that were um, uh, that were dysregulated. And then I also worked with my former classmate, now Dr. Kiwan Lee, to look at how exercise could be used in conjunction with traditional cancer treatments like chemotherapy to improve prognosis. My time, the first two years of uh, at USC was amazing. I, I did so much more than I ever thought I could. I uh, gave a podium presentation at the National ACSM Conference last year, which I never thought would be possible, especially as a grad student. Um, I've been able to mentor a lot of DPT students and undergrad students that are in our department. Um, I've been able to conduct my own research projects, and I actually obtained another master's degree just because I'm crazy. <laughs> Overall, in the field of exercise oncology, I learned that exercise is medicine, but now for the first time, I was actually able to like expand upon that and, and explain physiologically what that meant. And more specifically, I was able to, to show that muscle physiology is a great argument to prove that exercise is medicine. And that overall, exercise physiology is kind of this conduit to prove that exercise is medicine in clinical populations, which I think is really important when you're talking about um, changing public policy and things like that, or changing the way that practitioners in medicine approach their treatment with their patients. So my original goal for the last half of my time at USC was to look at cancer and actually the gut microbiota. When I was looking at the cancer, or when I was looking at cancer and other disparities that occur um, because of treatment, one of the things that kept coming up was gut dysbiosis or dysregulations in the gut microbiota. And I became really interested in it. I wanted to see if exercise could mitigate some of these dysregulations in cancer survivors. Um, that was my intent, but sometimes research trajectories change and um, it's not always a bad thing. But uh, now I'm not working in exercise oncology, but I'm actually working in neurodegeneration. Um, so my 
old PI actually got headhunted and now she's at another university. And I have a new advisor who works with neurodegenerative populations, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And at the time I thought that that was crazy. I didn't know how I could transfer exercise oncology to neurodegeneration, but it actually turned out working for like, uh, turning out way better because there's this, um, this concept called the gut brain axis that I think is more widely studied in gut microbial research um, than it is in cancer, at least to date. Um, it's essentially this communication between the gut and the brain. And in neurodegeneration, it's dysregulated. So I met with my new PI and we kind of came up with this idea that exercise could help to restore some of these dysregulations and improve the signal or the communication between the gut and the brain. So that's what I'm working on now. Um, I recently was awarded a scholarship, um, a, an NIH REACT Scholar Award to work on the first aim of my dissertation, looking at gut microbial changes in neurodegenerative populations. I'm also the research coordinator for an exercise in Parkinson's uh, trial called SPARKS. Um, and I am writing papers uh, vigorously and also preparing for my comps like Solse, which is super fun and very overwhelming. <laughs> Um, and in the future, I obviously hope to finish my PhD at USC successfully, um, get a postdoc, and then hopefully go into teaching. So I think overall, my tips for anyone that's looking to do something similar, going master's PhD, looking at exercise physiology research. Um, first, I would say overall, be flexible. Um, things are going to change. You never know what's going to happen. You don't know what um, opportunities are going to come your way. And kind of like Donnie alluded to, it's really important to be open to those opportunities. Um, don't take on more than you can, but uh, than you can handle. But at the same time, if something comes your way and you weren't expecting to get a PhD or get a master's, it might not be the worst thing in the world. It might actually turn out to be really good. Um, the other thing is that science requires a lot of resiliency and tact. So there's gonna be times where you're like, you will fail for sure. You will spend months and months working on a project and it won't work out or a paper won't get published or, you know, something bad might happen, but you just have to keep going and you have to be resilient um, and know that it happens to everybody. And then also don't be discouraged if you don't have any experience in a research field. I had no experience in exercise oncology, like absolutely none. I didn't even take microbiology as an undergraduate student. So going into cancer biology courses and things like that were really overwhelming, but I learned so much. And I think that as long as you're curious, then you're gonna be successful no matter what. So with that, I thank you for uh, listening to my spiel. If you have any questions about my research or anything, feel free to email me um, and hit me up on social media. All right, uh, morning everyone. Uh, happy to see everybody. Uh, today I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about the art and science of personal training. So uh, I've been a personal trainer for about six, six to five years. I've worked with various populations from general to athletes of different disciplines. Uh, so first, a little bit about my journey. So I did my undergrad at Cal State East Bay. Uh, during my time at Cal State East Bay, I was a two sport athlete. I was playing sports all year long. Uh, Cal State East Bay uh, cross country and track. After, after I finished, I just pretty much quickly realized that I was lost in my career. I, I didn't know where I didn't know where to go or what to do with kinesiology. So I had to quickly switch gears and start volunteering in the kid department. So I started volunteering with Dr. Sherwood. Uh, we did some research together, presented at ACSN conference, and from my experience at ACSN conference and with research that really triggered my desire to go on to grad school. And then I ended up applying to SF State and then uh, committing to SF State for the next uh, three years. Uh, following SF State, uh, I started working with uh, Exos. A uh, little, uh, little bit about Exos. Exos is a human performance company. Uh, Exos first started working with athletes. Uh, we're primarily known for working with football players, getting them ready for the NFL combine and getting them signed with a team. We have about a 80% success rate from what I hear. Uh, then we started working with the U.S. military forces by implementing the tactical training systems that Exos developed for that branch. And then after we moved on to corporate, uh, 
we started working with corporations such as Adidas in Germany, which was our first account we started working with. Uh, we started working with Ento and many others. And we started working with these corporations by helping them build their corporate fitness programs and running their fitness, cor fitness programs. Uh, I currently work in the corporate fitness branch of Exos. I work with the Exos uh, personal training team. I specifically work at the Google site. Uh, this is a this is a picture of my Google site at uh, San Bruno. And yes, we actually do have that big old slide. It's pretty cool. Uh, fastest way for me to get from second floor to first floor on the everyday basis. Uh, one of the coolest things about working in corporate fitness, just the ability to work with so many people uh, with different fitness backgrounds, uh, different goals. Uh, some of the people I work with are software engineers, uh, computer engineers, UX research, uh, user experience researcher guys. And then I get to work with directors and all that. And then uh, another cool thing is just being part of the Google community, understanding that community and just building relationships and connections with them. Uh, so getting to topics. So personal training to me is a very unique uh, profession within kinesiology. Uh, it has a component of the science in it. As you can see here from the Exos training systems, uh, some of the concepts you're pretty familiar with from schools such as uh, metrics, strength, power, uh, ESD, which means energy system development. And then you got the art of it, the creativity. Uh, you can see this coach getting really creative with, with this athlete, working on core stabilization and shoulder stability by having the athlete hold the kettlebell in a bottom sub position. So the science of it, uh, you definitely do take a lot of concepts from your uh, grad courses, undergrad courses into the field. Some of the things that I really took from all my classes and you have to really understand to be able to apply them are such things as progressive overload, uh, muscle adaptations such as knowing what drives uh, hypertrophy, strength, power, neural, neural adaptations, and then external cues to be able to teach people movement. And it's pretty much one of the easiest ways just to teach people movements uh, such as a deadlift. And then you got the research side of it. That's what really pushes the, the field forward, sets the guidelines, the research guidelines such as ACSM, NSCA, and all that good stuff. And then you got the art component of it, uh, which is probably one of my favorite things because it's where you put your creativity into play. Uh, this is where you take all the concepts from school and put them into real life application. This is where I learned the most when I started really applying everything from school into my into my career. And this is where you develop the, something called the coach's eye, which is pretty much being able to look at somebody, do a certain movement such as a squat, deadlift, run, being able to dissect the movement with your own eyes and just be able to see any flaws within the movement and be able to make modifications right there in the instant. And all these qualities are built through experience and a lot of trial and error. So uh, how, does the, how does the art and the science complement each other within personal training? Uh, I could give you a perfect scenario. A couple of years back, I got to work with, with a basketball player back at an internship. Uh, I have never worked with basketball players, specifically for somebody that's looking to get their vertical uh, jump higher or the vertex. Uh, one thing I had to do is just really look into the science, really look into force vector theory from this research article. And just understanding that the movement of jumping follows the axial vertical force vector and that you need to and in order to improve this vector you need to apply exercises that resemble the movement of jumping and also follow that force, same force vector so now you get into the creative side you can start thinking about squat variations deadlift variations that will help you build the strength component of it and follow the same force vector and then you could get a little more fancy by by implementing trap bar deadlift jumps, hang snatches, uh, plyometrics, which help to build a power component of it. And with all this, just combining all this, that really, really helped, uh, really takes out the rewarding part of it, just being able to help somebody improve on their performance. Uh, my biggest piece of advice for anybody looking to get into personal training, strength and conditioning, or even physical therapists, they're all very, all three are very similar. Uh, in all three, you're prescribing movement to solve a certain issue or a certain goal or to get to a certain goal. Uh, one is just being, being a lifelong learner. Until this day, I'm still learning. Um, and the more you learn, uh, the more people you're able to help. 
and also the better the quality of your services. Uh, some of the best ways I learn is going through is going to conferences, uh, reading research books, listening to podcasts, or anything just similar to that. Uh, Another piece of advice is just being an apprentice, shadowing as many coaches as you can, uh, not just personal trainers, but also strength coaches, uh, physical therapists, chiropractors. You will learn so much from each, from each discipline and you'll see that they all, did, they all use different methods, different philosophies, but they're always using the same scientific principles at the end of the day. And then the other one is just building your communication skills. Uh, knowing that you're in a field where you're communicating with a lot of people and then you're building connections, uh, relationships, and also you're doing a lot of active listening. And that's it for me. Uh, last but not least, I just want to thank my committee for always pushing me to be my best. And yeah, passing it on to Steven now, I guess. Thank you, guys. My talk is going to be on, uh, it's titled Progressive Overload, a Training Paradigm Guiding Academic Philosophy. As you uh, can probably already tell there, my name's Steven. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention is I also put a bunch of Star Wars quotes in here because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And I thought that the quotes were actually pretty uh, appropriate for each slide. So I put a little bit of effort into those. So just basically what I want to talk about is where uh, I have been, where I am today, everything in between, and trying to just give a good idea of, of some of the main takeaways that, that helped me get to those points. So a little background on education-wise, I did my undergrad at SF State uh, in dietetics. Uh, I've been at, I was at SF State for quite a long time, so since 2013. Basically, when you finish your degree in dietetics, ultimately the goal is to get into um, a dietetic internship, so you apply for that the chances actually aren't all that great. Um, so you have two options. You can either go back in and get a little bit more experience clinically, uh, which I wasn't too fond of. So I decided to try to demonstrate that I was enhancing my education by um, tackling another passion, which is exercise for myself. So I, I decided to, to do my master's degree in kinesiology with an uh, emphasis in exercise physiology. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the kind of in-between between then and then the doctoral program and a little bit um, but basically, fast forward to now, I'm at Baylor University doing my, my doctorate. Um, so basically, when I got news that I got in there, um, we, uh, my, my wife and I, we packed up all of our stuff and we drove from Hayward, California, all the way to, to Waco uh, with our little bunny. And uh, that was about a 30-hour drive. I also wanted to touch really quickly on uh, my thesis because that was actually a really formative experience for me. Um, it was uh, a case study on an elite powerlifter who had been using anabolic steroids for over 20 years. And, and basically what we looked at was single fiber, myosin heavy chain, but we also were able to look at cellular morphology. Um, and that experience for me was, was formative, as I mentioned before, just because it gave me an idea of, of what research um, could be uh, and, and basically kind of led me to, to want to follow doing a little bit more of that. So what did I gain out of F SF State? Well, number one, I gained a lot. Um, first and foremost, it, what it really did was it disassembled a lot of, of what I perceived college to be. Um, kind of like Donnie had mentioned before, like I just wasn't a very good undergrad student. I was I'm not very interested in doing anything besides watching anime and playing video games. Um, but when I got to the last year of my undergrad, I realized that, uh, go figure, I actually really enjoyed the stuff that I was learning because it was stuff that I was interested in. And when I got into the graduate program, I found that it organizationally was a lot more conducive towards learning with smaller class sizes that you could be a little bit more intimate with not only your peers, but also um, with the faculty members. So you're able to develop relationships, tighter relationships with them, and ultimately a greater uh, sense of responsibility in that sense. Um, also, it was, as I mentioned before, related back to my thesis, it was very formative in, in my um, decision to try to pursue research beyond that point. I learned that it was something that I actually enjoyed a lot more, and I didn't want to just use that uh, that degree to help push forward and, and try to reapply to a dietetic internship. And lastly, it gave me an opportunity to refine what my interests were. So I had already known that I was interested in nutrition. I knew that I was interested in exercise, and I really wanted to figure out how those two could kind of combine together, which leads me to where I am today. So today I'm at Baylor. 
uh, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I'm working uh, with this big guy over here, Dr. Darren Willoughby, uh, in the Exercise and Biochemical Nutrition Laboratory. Um, I thought that I would, I would say a little bit about what influenced my decision to go to Baylor. And first and foremost, it was funding. So I definitely tried to reach out to a lot of different faculty members at various universities across the country. They either don't respond to you or tell you that they don't have funding. So one major determinant uh, was that Dr. Willby actually had funding for, for a, a full assistantship, which was fantastic. Um, but it's not just the money. You shouldn't only pay attention to the money. You also want to make sure that you have some mutual interests. So as you can tell, he's a bodybuilder, um, and he has a huge focus on researching resistance training uh, and also nutritional components. So we have ideals that kind of, uh, or interests that kind of resonate from both an academic and a recreational perspective. Um, I also really wanted to do something that would kind of lead to the culmination of all of my academic experiences. So combining the nutrition from the dietetics, the exercise from the master's program, so the name of the program is actually Kinesiology, Exercise, Nutrition, and Health Promotion. So the first two things definitely work together synergistically and allow me to kind of um, even further refine those interests. Another thing that was really great about uh, working with him was that um, we get a lot of academic freedom. So we have uh, a huge ability to be able to pick the projects that we want. Um, he's not a huge fan of just handing off projects, but more so you have the autonomy um, but also the the risk of making mistakes, which are really important um, to be able to figure out what you want to do with your research. Uh, we also get a, a fantastic opportunity to um, do a lot of different laboratory techniques. So we all become DEXA certified. Uh, we get to do blood draws and we get to do biopsies. Uh, we use a, a specific method called the fine needle aspiration, which is a smaller uh, needle. So some of the research that we're doing or have been doing in these past couple of years, I'm not gonna go into massive detail here, but one thing that I, I think would set our lab apart um, from some of the other presenters is that um, aside from a molecular focus, we have a, a very um, applied focus. So some of the research that we've done in the past couple of years is related to molecular adaptations um, with supplementation towards outcomes related to aerobic uh, adaptation, to resistance exercise adaptation, um, looking at some uh, molecular pathways for uh, muscle degradation. Uh, and then that very one at the bottom is uh, a project that I came up with looking at how fiber type is, as well as some other uh, molecular markers influence powerlifting performance. Some of the research that we're doing right now, I'd love to talk about this a lot more, but 10 minutes is uh, definitely not enough time. Um, but we are looking at heart rate variability and how that influences um, and in, or is influenced by um, peaking protocols or resistance training protocols throughout national and, and just generally competitive power lifter performance over that um, period of time. We're also looking at how androgen receptor signaling is affected um, by low or high uh, load training, uh, as, as well as other things that can mediate that. So looking at things like co uh, activators like beta catenin and other proteins. And then the, the one on the right, this big picture right here is a study that I'm in charge of right now. We're looking um, at, this is a very powerlifting oriented research, but looking at how neoprene knee sleeves of varying tightnesses actually affect indices of muscular power, strength, and endurance. But you might be asking, my, the title of my uh, presentation related to progressive overload, but none of this has anything to do with progressive overload. Well, that is where you are right, but also mostly wrong. So I like to, to make this little analogy here, and I think the best way to do that, um, Jose was talking about how you implement progressive overload in a, in a resistance training scenario. So first and, and foremost, you always need to start off with the bar, which is what holds all the weights together. It's what allows you to build. The first thing that you need uh, is that bar, and that bar is, is analogous to a combination of passion or enthusiasm for the topic, as well as the ability to carry out that passion and enthusiasm over a long period of time. It can't be fleeting, so consistency. You build on that, you need the drive to be able to, to learn about these different topics. You need to be able to apply that to your own practice. That naturally is going to lead into wanting to do your degree. So that, that was the bachelor's degree for me, which sets those academic foundations. And then if you like that stuff enough, you're gonna go ahead and do your master's like I did at SF State. Um, that's going to refine your interests even further and really push you down that, that route of being able to develop your, um, your research ideas as well as your writing. Speaking of writing, you're going to need to be able to do a lot of that. And it's, uh, it's especially important to be able to not only write well and improve upon that writing, 
but also to develop your own original research, uh, be able to disseminate that because if, if the only people that are reading that are you and your colleagues, then it's, it's probably a waste. Uh, I also can't forget that uh, the importance of having great colleagues and, and great faculty members like Dr. Bagley, Dr. Lorenz, Dr. Kern, of course, um, and everyone. I also noticed that Donnie's in like 90% of these pictures. So, um, but without them, you definitely wouldn't be able to, to get any of this stuff done. And, and I definitely think that I've been very um, serendipitously lucky to be able to, to have people that um, complement all of my weaknesses, which are numerous. Lastly, the clip that holds all that weight together, you need to make sure that you, you take the time to appreciate your family members. I got my mom and my wife there on the side. Um, thanks, Dad, as well. Um, also, just being able to have friends to coerce into you know, getting along with your hobbies and your interests. Um, speaking of hobbies, there's a picture of, of me, uh, my wife, and, and uh, my buddy Richard dressed up as Star Wars characters because what does any of this serious stuff matter if you're not having fun doing some other weird hobbies and whatnot? So I wanted to end off with a quote, a couple of quotes actually. So a quote from Yoda, um, you're gonna have a lot of great ideas, at least what you think are great ideas. They're either gonna be okay ideas or they're gonna end up being completely trash. Um, but it is important to, to experience um, those failures, experience the, the fact that they're not gonna be fantastic ideas and build upon that, um, understanding where your failures lie. I don't wanna end with a, a light side quote because I'm more of a dark side kind of guy. So I'm going to end with a quote from my favorite character from Star Wars, uh, she Palpatine or the Emperor. Um, so it's not necessarily a quote, but it's more so that, you know, you're going to have those failures, but you need to make sure that you have backups or uh, contingency plans. Um, so, yeah, so thank you to, uh, to the SF State faculty. Thanks to all the, the people that really helped me get to where I am today. Dr. Bagley, Dr. Lorenz, Dr. Bolter, um, Dr. Virai, and, and especially Dr. Kern. I wanted to, to congratulate you on, on your uh, well-deserved retirement. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me, Dr. Bagley. Um, my name is Brittany, and I graduated from the SF State Master's Program in May 2017, and I currently work for Exos as a program manager. Um, I'm very much on the business side of things in the corporate fitness space, so this is about what science taught me about the business leadership and management. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to work in science. I've always known that. Bill Nye, the science guy, was my hero growing up. And I didn't know exactly what part of science I wanted to be in at first, um, but I knew I wanted to do something in that realm. So flash forward to high school and college, I realized I wanted to go down the physical therapy route, like many people in kinesiology. And uh, I was a lifelong athlete. I uh, grew up playing soccer and many other sports and then became a triathlete uh, endurance sports after college. So after I finished my bachelor's in biology at UCSD, I started doing all the physical therapy prerequisites, worked in a physical therapy clinics as an aide and a volunteer, and I applied to physical therapy school and got rejected, not once, but twice. <laughs> So like they said in the previous presentation, failure is a great teacher. So my mentor suggested that I apply to a master's program. So that's what I did. And in 2014, I started my journey at San Francisco State in the master's program. And I was working part-time as a personal trainer in addition to teaching a few undergrad classes. And I had a big commute uh, because of where I lived, so and I was still training for triathlon. Don't do that. It was too much. Um, but my priority during that time was to get the best possible grades that I could so I could set myself up for success. And I realized about halfway through the program that I did not want to go the physical therapy route anymore. The clinical side of things wasn't for me. I just couldn't see myself working with patients for eight, nine, 10 hours a day for the next 20, 30, 40 years. 
So just on principle, I applied to physical therapy school a third time and got rejected, but I wasn't bummed because I only applied to one school. And like I said, my heart was not in it anymore. So I was trying to decide between PhD programs and just going straight into the workforce. And my current, uh, my current job at the time at San Mateo Athletic Club, which is an Exos community site, um, I had amazing, amazing managers and I took on as much responsibility as I could. And it was actually them who recommended that I apply to this program manager position on the corporate fitness side of things within Exos. And that's what I did. Long story short, I got the position and I have been working there for over two and a half years and I had to take a failing account and make it successful. So that was my goal through the whole taking the program manager thing was to learn as much as I could about business and leadership and management because that was not something I had been exposed to and with my very extensive science background. So what I actually do as a personal as a program manager is a little bit of personal training, a little bit of group exercise, but I'm essentially a small business owner with a really good support system higher up. So I sit behind a computer a lot. I do quarterly business reviews, all the management stuff, uh, reports and, you know, record keeping, that type of stuff, marketing. I've done interior design and remodeling. I manage two facilities, soon to be three, and I have a core team of 16 people plus a few other, um, other group exercise instructors, and I manage budgets and vendors and basically all aspects of the program. And I could go on and on. If you want to hear more about what I've done over the two and a half years, please reach out to me because uh, it's been a lot, but there, there really would have been no better way to expose expose myself to the business side of things and I like it so much that I'm currently studying for the GMAT and hoping to apply to business school in hopefully this year. So I've learned a lot of parallels between business and science over the past two and a half years so much that it's it's blown my mind. So I'm going to share some of those parallels with you and we're going to start in the chemistry realm of things specifically with the second law of thermodynamics, which is all about entropy, as you might or might not remember, which is a measure of a system's disorder, specifically and broadly about chaos, disorganization, randomness. And if you've ever worked in a leadership or management position before, you know there is no more perfect metaphor about what management is than entropy. I spent a lot of my day being the glue that holds everything together. And knowing that things are gonna fall apart or fall into chaos, I have to be able to anticipate what ways things are gonna go sideways and I need to be able to hire a team who will help me keep on top of everything. And it's juggling a lot of balls in the air all at one time. Sometimes you get blindsided by things such as a company reorganization, or the biggest layoffs in your client company's history, um, it makes for a position that is hardly ever boring. And when things are boring, uh, you soak it up because you never know when the next thing is gonna come. Another parallel between science and business is the parallel between scientific studies and program management, and specifically running exercise programs for people. And the steps are very, very similar. We design a program based on creativity and we make a hypothesis based on programs that have been done in the past, maybe at our site or other sites. And we base that on data and results that other people have done, all the learnings that they've come up with. And we put that all together. We plan it. We put it in a timeline. We put the full details of the program into a slide deck, and then I present that idea to my boss or my client. Um, sounds like a thesis proposal, right? Um, and this is for, for pretty much any program we, we run. And then after things get approved, it's all about project management. So 
keeping those timelines and deadlines, managing my team and making sure who knows who knows what needs to be done by when and making sure those deliverables are actually completed. And then we have recruitment of human subjects or if you're running an exercise program, participants. So we have to recruit and put the word out there and use our marketing skills and find people to sign up, whether it's for a paid program or a free program that is sometimes much easier said than done. And then we have to know and anticipate those attrition rates. So usually for my population, I anticipate about a 33% drop off from people signing up to completion. So even starting the program, it can be sometimes be a 33% drop off. And then it's all about the de detailed record keeping. I got to manage my team. My team has to manage the participants. Sometimes I have to manage the participants and we have to keep detailed notes and communication. So written communication is key. So that people are sending the same message and speaking about the same things using the same language. Sometimes before our programs, we do pre-program surveys depending on what we're measuring. So are we having a stress relief program? Well, the only way to measure if people are relieving their stress is to do a pre-program survey, but that's optional. Our post-program surveys though are very essential. With any program we run, even if it's the 30 minute lunch and learn presentation, we do a post-program survey because that subjective data is, is key into knowing whether this was an effective use of our time or not. And speaking of effective uses of our time and knowing if a program was successful, we have to run statistics, analyze the data, whatever we have, objective or subjective. And if it is successful, can these results be replicated in the future? And this is success in terms of participation, in terms of revenue, uh, depends on what we're looking at. And if our program was not successful, we have to revisit our hypothesis. Do we need to pivot completely and find something different? Or can we just adjust it and tweak it and make it better than it was before? So with our data analysis and pr presentations, we need to tell a story. So when I'm giving my quarterly business reviews to my clients, they're very high, you know, very high level stakeholders in our program. So I can't just throw data at them. I need to tell them what we're looking at, why they should care, how this is relevant to their business and the money they're spending on our program. Because successful storytelling based on that data equals funding for my program, it equals job security for myself and our team. It's how I can get my team paid throughout quarantine. So present, presenting is more than just showing your results. Uh, it has much broader implications and my ma this master's program was so key in preparing me to put slide decks together and speak about uh, subjects that, you know, I might not have other otherwise spoken about. And then of course, getting ready for those questions after the presentation is done. Master's program was very key in preparing me for that. And the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with is the importance of networking and collaboration. So in business like science, you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time, whether that's studies or program design or management tools or your newest idea for research, reach out to people, reach out to your colleagues, reach out to your bosses, and someday they're gonna repay the favor. They'll ask you for your advice or networking because as we all know, Sometimes it's what you know, but more often it's who you know. And I wouldn't have gotten this current position without my former managers and knowing who I know. So you never know who's gonna help your career or what strengths or interests you'll discover because I never saw a business coming. Um, and it's been a fun and wild ride. So if you wanna connect with me, um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty, pretty active. Um, or if you look, looking at bikes and landscapes and pastries, can find me on Instagram too. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, uh, thank you for inviting me to our symposium, uh, Dr. Bagley, and congratulations on your tenure and uh, Dr. Kern, congratulations on your retirement.
Um, so my name is Ryan Dirk, and I'm going to tell you about how I found growth while in our graduate program and after. I do want to start in, uh, by just reiterating this idea that we all have a different path, and I'm going to go through what my path looks like, but if everyone, and you've heard many versions of this today, it looks different, and that's okay. So if you're a prospective student and considering going, your path might look different, and that's okay too. But here are some of the highlights of uh, my journey through our kinesiology program. I'm going to start, though, by talking about where I was post-undergraduate. So after my undergraduate degree, which was in kinesiology, I took some time off. I was considering mostly a clinical career. At that time, I actually just recently became a registered EMT and obtained uh, my strength and conditioning certification through the NSCA. I was also working three part-time jobs, really trying to figure out what I liked and what I could take forward into a career. I was actually working at a hospital, bouncing between an inpatient and outpatient clinic as a physical therapy aide. I was doing personal training, and I was even consulting for a medical research program. Between all that, I was finding opportunities to travel, because that's really, really important to me. So any chance I got, we would go camping, traveling, or trying to explore uh, our world. However, sometimes during that process, I decided to look towards a different path. Uh, the clinical route was no longer seen as interesting to me. I was really enjoying the research component. I was really enjoying finding opportunities to educate individuals. And I felt that a master's degree might give me additional opportunities. So starting graduate school, I really started to grow just from the whole process of learning in a normal classroom setting. Our department was very multidisciplinary. It seemed extremely collaborative. There was plenty of hands-on opportunity and they cultivated my interest, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. And these qualities really helped me grow as an individual in our graduate program. The next sort of stage in this whole process after consuming this information and consuming uh, and being a, just a consumer of information and trying to find growth there was growth through being able to share these interests with others. So you heard Kaylee discuss a little bit about our strength and conditioning club. We would get together and we would share this, these ideas and we would even just work out in the lab before it was remodeled and before we had a brand new lab um, and do this as a group and try to share these ideas. We also got to go to a bunch of conferences and there was more that I didn't go to, but I had to go to multiple conferences in Southern California as well as to a national conference in Minnesota where I got to share my ideas, begin networking and then begin uh, really exploring this community. And lastly, uh, when it comes to this sharing component while in the graduate program, I got to share these, these random ideas and anyone who was in our cohort um, or the cohort before or after me knows I was interested in the gut microbiome. And this is something that I got to share and it was really uh, encouraged that I explore these ideas. Finally though, towards the end of our graduate program and now, I started finding a lot of growth through the ability to create. And our graduate program gave me a lot of the basic foundation to be able to do that. I had opportunities as a graduate teaching assistant, which eventually turned into lecturing, where I could teach students at the university. I got to go to a conference as a graduate student and present at a, uh, at a national conference and actually give a slideshow presentation. And my master's thesis eventually turned into a publication where we were able to publish the research on the gut microbiome and the relationship to exercise. And I've been able to do continued research. We recently got another paper published about the gut microbiome changes in a world-class ultramarathon runner. We're also still expanding our continued research ideas into areas of breath because I'm very interested in this idea of breath and how it could be used in even extreme states to change your current state. So what happened after graduation I actually didn't go far. A position opened up as a teaching lab manager, and so I came on board now as a, uh, to work for San Francisco State as a teaching lab manager, and I was lecturing as well. So I got to begin creating these programs and sharing my interests with the students. We got to continue to improve our labs and work on these interesting and dynamic projects, including things like VR or that gut microbiome research I mentioned. Within this last year, I actually was able to interview and obtain our head strength and conditioning uh, position at the university. So I'm now still at San Francisco State, but working as the head strength and conditioning coach, taking my interest in education, research, and really being able to actually apply that. So living where those two worlds meet of research and application and trying to continue to give back to San Francisco State as well as the student body here. 
overall, to keep this short and sweet, I think SF State has plenty of opportunities uh, that it could offer you. If you're interested in something, I think SF State could help you pursue and refine that interest. I, like many of the individuals who are speaking today, uh, would encourage you to get involved. Uh, I'm a big believer that you're going to get out what you put in, and I was also a full-time student and worked full-time throughout this process, so there's plenty of opportunities that I unfortunately missed out on, but there's also plenty of opportunities you can continue to find. And whenever possible, I just think it's really important to give back, whether it's things like the symposium or in other ways, uh, maybe even to the research community but you have opportunities to grow and I would encourage you to continue to find those. I can't fit everyone in here, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to all the faculty, staff, uh, my cohort, uh, family and friends and other mentors that really helped to me, help me find growth and improve and continue to get where I am today. So thank you. everyone. Uh, I'm Taylor for all those who uh, don't know me and I'm just going to kind of take you through a little bit of uh, my transition from uh, being at SF State into uh, joining the uh, lab of John McCarthy at the University of Kentucky. So just a little bit about my background. I got a, a BS in kinesiology in 2009 at SF State. After that I was involved in a band and I really wanted to sort of live out the rock and roll life uh, uh, for as much as I could and I kind of started just to tour in the band for about a year and realized uh, even though my 18 year old self would, would have kicked me I thought this is this is not for me so I kind of wanted to get back to school but I wasn't sure what it was so I worked for a corporate gym for a little while and realized I didn't like that at all and I thought I could do this on my own so I started my own uh, training business and then simultaneously uh, went back to get my master's at SF State and graduated in 2015. And then I became an adjunct faculty there for, for a couple of years while I was kind of getting ready to apply for a PhD. And I'm currently a third year student at the University of Kentucky in uh, Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. So I'm in the lab of uh, John McCarthy. He's uh, this guy right here. He's just kind of like any one of us. He was a kinesiology uh, undergrad and master's and PhD student who just really liked the science and really like to kind of study the molecular aspect of kinesiology and he'll always tell you I he just wanted to come up he go, he wanted to reverse engineer the best training program so he could get as big as possible because he is a bodybuilder so that's kind of his roots and I seem to fit really well with him and uh, people in the lab as you can see over here these are sort of the different um, areas that we sort of that everyone's kind of studied the, the different projects that everyone is kind of looking at and how they contribute to overall skeletal muscle growth. Um, I'm involved with a couple different projects here, which I'll talk about uh, two of them during this talk, but these are kind of the highlights of, of what the lab does. So just kind of this scientific leap for me during my master's, it was, I, I spent a lot of time just kind of learning how to do science and it was from a very uh, applied standpoint. And at the end, I felt like I had developed really good skills in uh, developing a hypothesis and carrying out scientific experiments, but with the results and the tools I had, I, I kind of wanted to know more, and I figured if the way I could know more, I could try to get into a program where we develop, we would do a lot more uh, basic science work to kind of answer questions. The only caveat to that is I barely held a pipette before I came to this program, so I felt very out of place. And joining a lab where everyone is heavily into molecular biology is kind of intimidating, especially when you hear conversations about people saying, oh, I just generated a double stable clone and we're gonna get ready to, you know, to turn on or turn off a gene. You start thinking, oh my goodness, am I, can I even do this? But I wanted to do that and that was kind of my, the goal for going to a PhD and I thought, okay, this is the place to do it and this is exactly what I want. As scary as it can be, I felt like that was a great position to be in because I knew that I would learn the most. And so, kind of what happened along the way of making that sort of leap from kind of doing a, a applied sciences and in, into doing some more basic stuff. Well, I think a common theme I've heard today so far is that, uh, well, first, I just felt out of place and felt like an imposter. 
And I think, again, that, that was a good thing as much as as scary as it sounds, but I think that meant I would have the most room, uh, room to grow. If I just went somewhere where it was going to be really easy and I set myself up for success, I don't think I would know or learn as much. Now to the common theme is failure. I think that is a really good thing. As much as it's scary and as much as it's, it's terrible to do, you learn so much. And I failed so many times um, during starting my project uh, that I just, as each time I fail, I said, okay, now I know this and I'm, I'm going to be better for it. And so it's one of those things that I think when you start doing it, you get better and you learn how to cope with it and you can pick yourself back up and then keep moving forward. I made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> some were quite expensive, and that's just this kind of the name of the game. You go out, again, you do some things that uh, didn't work the way you wanted to, and when they ask for the data, you're like, oh, well, you know what, uh, funny question about that. But again, it's one of those things where, where you learn and you're, and you're growing, and you know you're gonna get better as you keep progressing. I had, I had and I have a ton of fun. Each day is new and exciting, even during the, uh, COVID pandemic, there's still ways to have fun and to kind of make your research matter. And so it's always a fun, enjoyable experience to do, even though it can be very scary at times. And then I learned more than I ever possibly could. And I'm still learning and I'm still exploring and I'm still challenging myself as we advance. And so it's one of those kind of, it's kind of this linear relationship where I really haven't felt like I've hit any sort of plateau. And so it's been really fun because each day, like I said, there's something you can learn and there's more things you can learn. And at least in my lab, there's really, there's a lot of, uh, there's a great emphasis on just keep going and keep exploring and, and sort of this more self-directed learning and kind of teach yourself um, at, you know, as you go along. And so one of the postdocs in the lab, uh, just for example, there are uh, things you can do where you image a muscle and you have to count each individual muscle fiber. And you can imagine if you have a ton of different sections, each one of those sections having hundreds of different fibers, it can get quite boring to count each one individually. Well, he just decided to teach himself computer coding and he came up with a coding program that counts for you. And so now instead of us having to go in there and manually count hundreds, if not thousands of muscle fibers, you just put it into the program and it will count for you. And so it's kind of that type of environment where people just said, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this better for me. Uh, that kind of really impressed me and inspired me to say that's kind of the same thing. And so it's kind of, again, putting, surrounding yourself with people who are really in to just bettering themselves has been a great uh, uh, learning experience for me. And then finally, again, sort of one of my most favorite quotes from a movie Fight Club is, how much do you know about yourself if you've never been to a fight? And I want to say off the bat, I know this movie is talking about a physical fight between two people but I think if you just kind of get rid of that violent part how much do you really know about yourself if you haven't challenged yourself and so I really think you know for me it's just been this uh, kind of non-stop challenge myself to be better and to do more and to keep exploring that has really helped push me along and I really think as humans we really enjoy challenging ourselves even though that sounds you know crazy it's like why would somebody climb half dome without any you know uh, without any ropes because the challenge is there. So I really think we're built for that and that kind of helps push me along the way. And so I'm going to talk about two uh, projects that I'm currently involved in. One is my current thesis and another one is a side project. And maybe people here in, in the graduate and uh, PhD programs will know there's always a ton of projects. So you just kind of get involved with ones that you can work on and sound interesting to you. And so the first project I'm going to talk about is how does the gut microbiome regulate skeletal muscle? One of the things to know about this is that my, P and I, my PI and I kind of both kind of had this shared interest in microbiome research, but we're neither of us are microbiologists. And so we were just like, yeah, it sounds like this could be a really cool thing. And he's like, well, I don't know anything about it, so you're going to have to take it on. And uh, if, if you want to, you're going to have to sort of be, uh, you'll have to teach me. And I thought, okay, well, that's going to be tricky, but I'm up for the challenge. And so really kind of just to sort of briefly state what we did is we trained mice with or without antibiotics to uh, knock down the microbiome. And they went through this eight-week uh, progressive weighted row running protocol. And what you can see over here, if you look at the soleus data, you can see that in the untreated runners, there was a significant increase in soleus CSA. However, in the treated runners, those runners we had a knockdown biome, there wasn't any increase in CSA. Now these mice both, they both ran the same 
um, out. So their volume was the same. There wasn't any difference in training volume, but the CSA and the treated runners did not grow. Now this growth was also mediated by type 2A specific fiber increase. So again, you can see that in the untreated runners, there was a significant increase in the CSA, the type 2A fibers. However, this was not shown in the treated runners. If you move over to the plantaris data, just to show you a little bit of that, there was a significant fiber type shift in the untreated runners where they had a significant increase in the type 2As and a significant decrease in type 2B, type 2X. However, that fiber type shift did not really pop up at all in the treated runners. So this is kind of the first data to, su to suggest that the microbiome really might have a role in skeletal muscle adaptation to exercise. And we're currently, or I'm currently working on getting this, uh, all this data ready for publication, hopefully by the end of the month or in the early June. And so one other project that I'm involved in is looking at aerobic glycolysis and mu muscle growth. And you might remember aerobic glycolysis, sometimes called the Warburg effect. It's kind of what tumors do where they sort of, they have uh, ample, uh, they, I guess they have the environment to undergo oxidative phosphorylation, but they do this metabolic switch where they just rely heavily on glycolysis and they kind of rapidly grow. And what a postdoc had sort of figured out looking at some gene array data under mice who have undergone this surgery called synergous ablation, which is a surgery we do to induce hypertrophy in the plantaris muscle, where you essentially cut out the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle. It kind of is this super physiological way to get a mouse muscle to grow. He noticed that there were some gene expression data showing that response to hypoxia was going way up in the early days of synergous ablation. And so we started looking through all the data I'm going to show you a graph that's kind of busy, but I'll try to kind of walk, you, walk through it slowly. But what we essentially found was that there's this big increase in this gene right here, HIF1-alpha, uh, or hypoxia-inducible factor 1A. And what sort of happens with the story that we're sort of lining out is that this muscle-specific microRNA, MIR1, actually blocks this SRC this proto-oncogene, but under hypertrophy, especially synergous ablation, MIR1 leaves the cell. And so MIR1 leaves the cell taking off the SRC or the break, which allows HIF1-alpha to actually um, basically stabilize, translocate to the nucleus, and up or increase the gene expression of a lot of different genes involved in the uh, glycolytic and pentose phosphate pathway. And so we're sort of trying to figure out why this mechanism is happening. We're putting together um, some data right now to sort of suggest that this might be going on under at least synergous abl ablation, but it could al also kind of go back to some of the uh, training you might see with blood flow restriction. And I know that Stephen just published a review on that, but this might be kind of one of those mechanisms where you sort of metabolically reprogram the muscle cell. So those are just kind of two things that I've been working on here in the lab. And then from there, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to me gab away for a little bit of my research. Got to show the two little wee ones. Congratulations, Dr. Bagley, on getting tenure. It's very, very much, uh, I very much agree with that. And of course, to Dr. Kern on your retirement, you have been and always will be such an integral part of my life. Uh, and especially research, you're kind of molding me who I am. And so it's a pleasure to sort of see you at least virtually here and say thank you again, but just know that you've always been such, such a pivotal uh, person uh, for me. So thank you so much, and that's it. My name is Kelly, and I went to SS. I'm a third year medical student and right now we're back at home we're doing online actual tapes in the hospital so I'm taking infectious disease and we do rounds actually online professors and we go bedside of stand still until we can go until we take an excited almost from exercise physiology to becoming a physician so I grew up in Sacramento and I actually did my undergrad at UC Davis. Um, I never really knew what I wanted to do. So I never knew that medicine was gonna be my destination. 
but I loved science. And so I figured I'd go to a big four-year university and hopefully find opportunity there. Um, I was still undecided, so I decided to study psychology. I also was interested in anatomy and physiology, so I took my first anatomy course at Davis and fell absolutely in love, and then decided to take an exercise physiology class and decided that would have to be my second major. At this time, I was also getting into running, so I was an endurance runner. I loved marathons, half marathons, um, and eventually got into ultra marathon running, but exercise physiology just became my passion. So. Once I graduated from Davis, I didn't know what I wanted to do still. I was interested in maybe doing physical therapy or becoming a personal trainer or maybe being an exercise physiologist working in a hospital. But because I wasn't sure, I took a year off. I actually lived in Alaska for a summer and worked as a flight coordinator and just kind of traveled and lived my life. When I came back, I actually was a participant in a study at UC Davis where they were looking at bone density for female athletes and runners specifically. So I actually, in doing that study, really became friends with the PhD student working on the project and thought, wow, actually doing research could be really fun. I love doing all the exercise stress testing and reading the literature. So she actually inspired me to go and get my master's and hopefully work doing research in exercise physiology. So that's when I applied to SF State in 2014. Uh, once I started at SF State, my main goal was really to just throw myself in and get involved in as many projects as possible. So I actually became a teaching assistant. So I taught anatomy and exercise physiology. Um, I had gained some teaching experience at Davis after I took anatomy. I worked two years as a teaching assistant in their anatomy department. Um, I also helped Casey Westbrook. She was a graduate student at SF State with 100 citizens, so I would volunteer teaching a free exercise program at local parks. Um, I also got working at Baseport Preventative Medicine. One of the graduate students at SFSU worked there and I was able to find that opportunity by networking with her. Um, I was able to attend multiple ACSM conferences. Um, I actually also volunteered at Seton in Cardiac Rehab and finally figured out a topic to do my research on for my master's thesis. So, Entering grad school, I just tried to do a little bit of everything, hoping I would find something that I was really passionate about um, to do research on. And I actually had a hard time figuring that out. I loved endurance running. I really wanted to do something with runners, but ultimately after a year into grad school, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had um, actually a personal tragedy in my life. I lost a parent and I really just wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, but between being in the hospital with my family and actually being in cardiac rehab at the time, working with the physicians there, I kind of decided that I actually wanted to become a physician and that's how I wanted to help people ultimately. And then I loved the clinical side of things and wanted to pursue that. So a year into the master's, I started taking night courses at UC Berkeley. Um, I started studying for the MCAT and I also started figuring out what I was going to do for research so that I could finish the master's and move on to the next step. So I ended up researching Fitbit Aria Scale, and I have to thank Dr. Kern for this because it was her idea to get this project underway, and I definitely couldn't have done it without her help with Dr. Bagley and also Dr. Lee. So they were huge influences in this project and helped me so much. Also, shout out to Dulce because scheduling all of the participants, we had to come in for all of these um, weighings and bod pod measurements was quite an undertaking. So did research on the Fitbit Aria. We presented at a couple conferences. I actually did a presentation on this research for um, a San Francisco State Research Competition and won under the category of Health, Nutrition, and Clinical Sciences. Um, and then we actually went on and presented at a regional CSU um, competition. So Dr. Bagley and Dr. Kim came with me to San Luis Obispo to watch me present. Um, and then finally, not during the master's, but while I was in medical school, we got it published in Health and Technology. And I have to thank Chloe for that because I couldn't have done it without all of her help in rewriting. So once I got my master's, I started applying to medical school. And if it wasn't for SFU, I would not have had anything to talk about in these interviews. The main topic of conversation was constantly my thesis, what I had done with teaching at grad school, um, 
it really was the main point of every single interview. And I think it's one of the main reasons I got accepted into a couple medical schools. So I know that I could not be with where I am without the help and my time at SFU, SFSU. So once I got into Western, I started medical school. I, of course, still loving exercise physiology and preventative medicine, joined the lifestyle medicine track. And I also became the president of the Wilderness Medicine Club. So I would organize hikes and backpacking trips and speakers from the region to talk on emergency medicine or other wilderness medicine topics. And even in this time, I still, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I wasn't sure exactly what field of medicine I would want to um, pursue. And because I loved the wilderness medicine and because I was interested in emergency medicine, I thought that might be a really good avenue for me. But it actually wasn't until this year, two months ago, I was rotating and I did finally did rotation in ob um, completely fell in love. So I knew I liked surgery. I've always loved anatomy. Um, I love the preventative medicine, exercise physiology, and I wanted to educate patients on that. So one of the, one of the um, fields of medicine where I can kind of do all of these things is ob -GYN. So this year I will be rotating primarily in ob -GYN at different hospitals and I'll be applying for residency next March. Um, so it's been a journey and I've taken a lot of different career paths to get here, but I know I couldn't have done it if it wasn't for my master's at SFSU and all the support I had along the way. So um, if anyone has any questions, there's my email um, about medical school or any opportunities at SF State. But yeah, thank you. Hi everybody, this is Chloe. Um, I'm a current graduate student, student of Dr. Bagley's and um, myself and Liam and Casey are going to be running the Q&A portion of this event. So if anybody has any questions, um, you can either take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask um, or you can drop it into the chat and we'll ask, uh, ask them for you. Um, but then we also have come up with a few questions to ask uh, the panelists. So I'll give you guys a minute if you have any questions. Um, go ahead and drop those in and we'll we'll get started with that. First question would be for Kaylee, Dulce, and Kelly. Um, after finishing your MS, how has your perspective on your career path changed? And you guys can kind of answer in that order or however. So after after now the MS is over, how what has your perspective changed from being in the master's program versus what you're doing right now? Can you say my name first? Thanks. Um, I I don't think it's changed too much for me, just because I took time off in between undergrad and grad school. So by the time I got to SF State, like I already knew that I wanted to get a PhD, and I knew like I wanted to go like down that path. But there's like specifics about the path of the, like getting a PhD that have changed my perspective a little bit as I've gone into it. Like I at first thought that I like wanted to do teaching and that's all I wanted and I didn't really want to do research other than my dissertation. But now that I've gotten into research, I definitely love it more than I thought I would. And so now that has kind of like changed my perspective of things. Uh, I can go next. Um, well, clearly going into a doctoral program was not originally in my game plan. Um, it never really had been, and it wasn't until I was at San Francisco State when I started doing all these lit reviews that I found myself always going to a specific topic of interest. Uh, and even as I'm still in my PhD program, I, I continue realizing more about myself that I didn't really want to accept. So as much as I love teaching, I am an introvert and I need to kind of balance myself out to make sure I don't completely wear myself out teaching for my students, um, but also kind of finding a balance with research and figuring out if I do want to stay in this path, kind of how I would make it work with the equipment that's required around it. So um, San Francisco State was clinical exercise physiology. And while I love it and it's important, um, the basic science side is kind of, it was a challenge and an obstacle for me, but I mean, look, Dr. Kern made it work and I found myself that if she can do it, I can make this work for myself as well. 
Um, and it's all like accepting the experience overall. Like uh, I'm a person that likes my life to have planned out from the people that do know me. And uh, I realized along the way that it will never work out that way. And learning to be okay with that is a uh, part of the journey as well. So I'm still kind of figuring out where my life is going as well. And I think for me, I'm very similar to Dulce. I, I don't know if my perspective has changed a ton. I know coming out of the program, I was infinitely more confident in myself. I felt like I could read research and understand it and synthesize it well, which is so important going into medicine um, and being evidence-based. And I also think I learned a little bit how to balance different aspects of my life during the graduate program. Um, cause I was working, I was going to school, I had my family. Um, and I think I really tried to bring that into medical school as well, because there was even less time and I still tried to get out and do the things I loved. Um, so hiking, exercising, um, seeing friends and family. Um, but I think the biggest thing is I just learned balance, definitely be okay with change. That is something that you need to, or I needed to accept early on. So I'm like, don't say I love the plan. Um, but I think my perspective is still very similar and I've just grown a lot. And it was a really good avenue for me to grow and become uh, the person I am now and hopefully a better physician because of it. Thank you guys. Um, and I think Liam has the next question for you. Okay, so this is gonna be for Steven, Taylor and Ryan. So what advice to do you get, do you, will you give if plans don't work out? How do you move forward? Um, I guess I'm going first because I said my name first. So plans don't work out. Um, you know, I've always kind of just been of the opinion that uh, kind of, I, I can't remember who said it, but if things really just don't work out, you kind of just roll with it and, and you can make the best out of any given situation. So. I mean, for me, my big thing was was saying that everything kind of builds on top of itself. And I think that if you have a certain level of experience, it'll it'll kind of play out in a way that you'll be able to create opportunities. And at the end of the day, no, no situation is necessarily perfect either. I, I don't think that even if I were to get my dream job by the time that I get my, my dream job, whatever university or whatever position that would be, I don't think that I would be necessarily you know, 100% happy, but I think that it's it's making making do with what you have and being able to adapt that situation. Um, it's just a, an ability of, of just being able to get back on that, that horse and ride it out too, if that made any sense. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think when, when things don't work out, well, one thing, one, you have to sort of see kind of between the lines. If, if it didn't work out, there, there might have been a reason so you know sometimes it might steer you in another direction that you thought you're like oh I know this is it like and then oh it's not but what is it telling you what is that you know talking about a, a research project or what it, what is it telling you in terms of life I know this might sound like so, so cheesy and stuff but like I, it, people will tell it to me all the time oh everything happens for a reason Taylor but like th there are some times when I, I if you really be patient and kind of like listen things you, you might kind of find what you're looking for. And uh, just to give you my own uh, example of that, uh, I had applied for a PhD program prior to coming to Kentucky. And I, I thought it was it. Like, I was like, this is, this is it. Um, it was a, it was a dual mentor lab. So there were two mentors and I was like this, you know, I'm This is where I'm going. And it ended up not happening. And I was heartbroken. I almost gave up. I was like, this is, this is just complete crap. I can't believe it. Um, then I, I, long story short, got into Kentucky and, and about a year after being in Kentucky, I was talking to someone and they said, oh yeah, you know, that lab, they had a professional falling out and they split ways. And one person went to another university and there was drama and there was tension, blah, 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 blah. And so it was like, oh my goodness, I sort of, had I been there at that time, I would have been stuck in the middle of this where I had already moved my family one place. I would have to potentially move them to another place or, you know, there'd just be stuff and I kind of thought, well, that's the reason why I probably didn't get it. And so, so I, get, I guess being, being patient and kind of listening is, is, is something I would do. And don't, don't get frustrated, even though you want to be frustrated, it's fine. You can be frustrated, but just kind of calm down and, and see really what, what, what is life telling you and then kind of move from there. 
I want to echo uh, a little bit of what Taylor said just now, as well as in his presentation. I think failure is a great teacher and it, it'll definitely give you something to learn from it if you're willing to listen. Um, and I think another really important key is simply being able to adapt and overcome. Uh, those are really key important qualities to any situation. If you're being adaptable, you could find ways to be successful. And if you could find the, that ability to adapt, you'll find ways to thrive. Thank you. Uh, I think the next one will be Casey asking the last question or yes. if we have any more questions. Yeah. All right. So uh, this question is for uh, Donnie, Jose and Brittany. Uh, for those who are planning of thinking into going uh, at into corporate fitness, what advice can you give them for breaking into the business? Uh, I'll start first. So, so for corporate fitness, uh, basically, I started out at a big box gym. I started at Fitness 19. From there, I moved into different uh, different types of settings, uh, exercise physiology settings, internships. Uh, I moved them to smaller gyms, boutique gyms, and then sort of corporate fitness just came out of nowhere for me. And then I just applied things to a friend, thanks to my friend Jerry. He told me to apply, try it out, and I tried it out and I loved it. And ever since that, I, I stayed in corporate fitness. Yeah, I can go next because um, I have a couple different perspectives on this. So as a personal trainer, I think you should, like Jose said, get your start at a big box gym. Um, they will often hire brand new trainers who are green and have no experience. Um, it's a good way to get your foot in the door. Um, and that can be a big box gym or any kind of big community gym, um, like San Mateo Athletic Club, which is an exosite, it's a community gym, but it's kind of like, I describe it as a one-off equinox. Um, but just get, get your foot in the door and get some experience because as a manager and a hiring manager specifically, um, when I'm looking to hire personal trainers for a corporate client, uh, especially in the Bay Area, I'm not hiring anyone who's a beginner. Um, my clients won't like that. They won't get any business. Um, people in the Bay Area especially are very, very, um, degrees and certifications matter a lot. Even if they don't know what those degrees and certifications are, if you're a personal trainer, if you have that alphabet soup behind your name, uh, that matters a lot. So as a manager, as a corporate fitness manager specifically, um, I am looking or people who are experienced um, in more than just exercise, but also uh, psychology and motivational interviewing in psychology as well. So for breaking into corporate fitness, experience is definitely better, but it's all about networking. Um, like Jose said, I didn't, I found myself in corporate fitness. It's not what I set out to do. So uh, yeah, it's, it's who you know. I believe you asked me as well, but I am not a personal trainer and I've never worked in the corporate environment, so I have nothing to contribute. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, Brittany did a good job explaining it. Uh, just uh, get some good experience and have good references, people that uh, you work with, uh, professors, things like that. Uh, and just make a lot of connections. And then uh, if you're aiming for it good and you get it excellent, uh, just know that there's other opportunities out there for you as well. Glenn has one question for Donnie. Now that he has completed and is making all this money, has he completed the ATP tattoo on his arm instead of leaving it as ADP? Uh, I, I added uh, phosphocreatine to it actually. Um, I was gonna plan on getting, or I was planning on getting uh, a lot more work done, but then I decided that tattoos weren't a good investment right now. And I decided to invest it in something that could give me some return value in it. But uh, eventually, uh, when I'm rich, famous, and could uh, donate all uh, a bunch of money to the Muscle Fizz Lab, then the tattoos will come back into play. Excellent. <laughs> Glad to hear. <laughs> so thanks again, everybody, for coming. Thank you, all the alumni and speakers. And uh, thank you, Exercises Medicine, for taking the time to organize this. Uh, we do have our contact information here on this last slide. Please stay in touch. I really want to start doing something like this every year. You know, hopefully it can be in person next year, but um, if not, we'll continue doing it online and just stay in contact.